now that I don't know him anymore. Hey, is that Mozart? That's not Mozart, that's my word. Oh, good for you. <laughs> Go. That was the Central Park West. Central, Central Park, Park Waltz. By our guest, Gregory Singer. We'll get to you in just a few minutes. But welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vretos, and I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College and Yeshiva University here in New York. As Duke Orsito put it in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, if music be the food of love, play on. We usually remember and quote just this part, but there's another part which says, give me excess of it, surfeiting, the appetite, the appetite may sicken and so die. Orsino was referring to his own broken heart in love and the meaning of the complete quote was clear. If it's true that music makes people more in love, keep playing, give me too much of it, so I'll get sick of it and stop loving. We at the Radical Imagination respectfully disagree with Shakespeare's fictional character on this one. We could never have enough love or great music. They are two of the ultimate joys of living that we can never experience enough of and which are absolutely basic to transforming and healing a highly dysfunctional and oftentimes heartless world. We have a guest today on the show who epitomizes that first part of Shakespeare's line. He's an old friend and comrade whose love of music and art is obvious and exudes in his whole being. He shares that joy and life force with all who come in contact with him. His musical pedigree is of the highest. His mother was a classical pianist and his father, Jacques Singer, was a Polish-American virtuoso violinist, symphony orchestra conductor of the Dallas and Vancouver symphonies, and a music educator who championed contemporary music by established and emerging composers. Gregory has followed in his footsteps and added a few of his own. He's a virtuoso violinist in his own right, is the founder and conductor of the Manhattan Symphony, and is the owner of Gregory Singer Fine Violins a fixture on the Upper West Side of Manhattan for many years. It's around the corner from Zabar, who we'll talk <laughs> about. Uh, and so before we meet Greg, here's a short clip of him conducting his orchestra, the Manhattan Symphony.
that was a short clip from you and the Manhattan Symphony. Uh, so in order to see more, we need to go to your concert. Welcome, Maestro. Well, it's an honor. Thank to you, the well, Radical Imagination. It's great to be here. It well, is really wonderful to see you again. Well, we haven't done a show in a while. It's true. And it's it's just. I'm just thrilled to have you here. Well, that's for, so very, very nice of you. It, it's very uh, eloquent what you said and, and very uh, flattering and very articulate as you are. Well. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's actually true uh, what you're saying, not about me per se, <laughs> but about uh, a quest, striving for excellence and to communicate well with music to people. And that's what you do so well. You, you can do it at Carnegie Hall. You do it on the street. Right. You, you can do it anywhere. And you connect with people in all that's sorts right. of ways, right. playing all sorts of music. That's and correct. you're unusual in that way. Mm. And, and, and again, you've been through uh, the established academic protocol, if you will. At right. you, you, were, you studied at Juilliard. So, uh, and you come from, again, as I say, one of the greatest conductors uh, right. my childhood was with uh, great musicians visiting yeah. my family I bet. my mother a pianist father a violinist and con conductor so we had great artists coming to the house all the time but um, in a sense my making music's not so unique per se everyone uh, who wants to make music makes music in their own way some mm -hmm. play guitars some play drums some have a limited let's say uh, technical ability or knowledge of music but they'll communicate in some way uh, others might have too much uh, knowledge and technique and they have no uh, way to express, let's say, something very human or something that you can relate to as a... As they a become too much like machines. Intellectual, you know. Yeah, too intellectualized. Right. So now, when I was younger, I was very uh, restless. I didn't like to practice the violin, though my parents made me, which I'm glad they did. Um, but I went to concerts and was bored by classical music many times. Hmm. So when I go to... But not by your... Uh, not by my father's, uh, no. Your father's music... No, but my father also had very great programming and he loved music and he right. was naturally able to communicate the love that transferred to me. And, and you weren't finding that in the concerts you were attending. No. Now what happened there? Your father was... I ran away from music for uh -huh. a while. Uh, uh -huh. My father passed away and... Uh, we became a little disjointed, my family, and I began to seek uh, my own destiny, my own fate. And fortunately, I came back to music. And I, I love music more than ever, and it means something very special to me. And then when I go on stage and I, I see my audience, I feel like I must share something I'm proud of, that I love, and the audience feels that energy and they, they, they love it. And so in, in one sense, the formula is very simple. I perform only what I love to perform, and I share, I write my own music, and the mm -hmm. audience is not bored. They, they and that was the it. first uh, piece that we heard with Central Park Waltz. Well, the Central Park created? Waltz is, is a, a melody. I, I, I woke up uh, one morning, and there I was uh, with this melody in my head. So mm -hmm. I began to, uh, to write it down. And then over the next few weeks, I, I began to uh, develop it a little more so. And just uh, flowed. Yeah, just flowed. And I've played that Central Park waltz all over the world, and people love it. It's quite simple. It is not beautiful. A, you know, not a lot of people are writing waltzes these days, and I've written a few waltzes since, but uh, it's quite a, a charming uh, a communication tool. But a little personal here. Sure. I mean, you mentioned your father. It must have been a powerful, powerful force in your life, and, and losing him. How old were you when he passed uh, on? Close to 21. Wow. But I was immature for my age. I was well, about a 16-year-old, really, mentally. Okay. And as we, the show goes on, we'll, our immaturity will... Well, we'll, we'll be noticed, yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, no. But we're, we're very close friends and comrades here. And uh, uh, what I love so much about you is that you can have fun. And you are a, an enormously fun individual, as well as serious. And you know your stuff. And, uh, but going back to your father here, a powerful influence, you lose him, um, and how long, you say you ran away from music, how long did it take before you began to reestablish yourself in music? And, well, it's not a matter of emulating, but, f you know. Sometimes, yes, it's true, yeah. yeah. And you're wearing his. His tails. His I'm tails I'm right I'm now. I'm wearing that he That he wore as he performed. For many years, yes. For many, many years. Yes. And you're s and you're so proud of him. You should be. And so, how many years did it take before you were well back um, through performing? circumstances? I began to form uh, the orchestra in 2005. Mm. Just prior to that, I began to to realize more and more my sanctuary in music. I began to love music, 
and, and love performing and communicating this way. But um, it was a, a huge shock to lose my father. Uh, he was a huge mentor in my life. And I was, in a sense, so immature, as most males are about 10 years younger than their numerical age. Mm. I was 21, but literally uh, like a 16-year-old. Mm. Mathematically, not exactly 10 years, but I'm yeah. saying roughly yeah. I was immature. So yeah. I couldn't quite relate to him as really as a man. But as, as, a, as his son, I looked up to him a lot, and I loved his music making. And when I performed the music he performed that I got to hear when I was a young boy, it, it also makes me very close to him and, of course, to a great tradition of, of music making. Um, so uh, it took me a while. Now, when, when he was alive, I also was a bit distant from music at times, trying to find myself. Uh, and I, I quit the violin a bit, traveled around the world, did different odd jobs. You, you went to Juilliard? I went to Juilliard also. But you... I didn't enjoy it very much. Tell us a little why well, you did. Well, you we'll know, it's it's sort of like a factory. It's hmm. a, it's a very cold environment. Um, um, the some of the performers, is, the young students, were very very virtuoso players, very wonderful people in their own right. But the whole idea is under so much pressure to churn out the, these uh, musicians playing the same music over and over and over. And uh, I was a bit restless. My attention span wasn't great. And I began doing some uh, popular music, uh, Broadway shows. I was doing some gigs, so to speak. And so... You were with Judy Collins I, for a while. Yes. Right? You were her... I was her road manager. Road manager. I, in contractor. Right. I hired musicians and helped uh, produce some, some work with her at the time. We did a tour right. together. Right. And uh, worked with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. And mm -hmm. with uh, uh, Tom Jones and Engelbert Humperdinck and some mm. other performers. Uh, Broadway shows. Uh, and so... It was difficult to stay in school at Juilliard and, and, and with the kids who didn't have any experience in the real world. Um, but I found the environment at the Lincoln Center very cold and uninspiring in many ways. And uh, just practiced and practiced. And, and uh, not very nurturing. Not nurturing and at all. And maintaining a certain immaturity at certain levels, right? About well, yeah. life. On, on the other hand... You is know, that changing, though? Is that um, changing I was days? lucky in a sense. Music was a theme in my life. Playing Broadway shows and, and becoming older, touring around the world and becoming older. I was able to see the world a little bit from a, from a distant view. The music protected me always. I was sort of insulated by the band or the orchestra or the, 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 the music I was doing. Then when I... What was about the, the beauty of it? What, what, what Listen, I was doing Peter Pan as an example. It. I played Peter Pan eight shows a week, something like that. And hearing beautiful yeah. melodies uh, that many times a week was wonderful for a year and a half or so with Sandy Duncan. Yeah. And then I played in The King and I with Yul Brynner. And hearing those incredible melodies like seven, eight times a week for a year, or however long it ran till he, he became ill with cancer and passed away. I mean, this was sort of my protective shield. I could, I could grow up into a, a more mature man. I'm still working on that. But You're doing okay. Yeah, You're thanks. Doing very well. But um, <laughs> the, the music was always a motive. It kept me focused, gave me a certain discipline. And I always mm. felt a bit special. And meaning. Yeah, like I also was training in a sense for Olympics that almost never came. But by studying violin since the age of four, I always felt a bit special that I was training for, for the future, for something better to come. Hmm. And so now it's sort of coming to fruition. Uh, I'm glad I met you. I'm on your wonderful show. I'm and glad And I'm reaching we met. more audiences. And so it's coming yeah. to fruition now these days, I'd say. Absolutely. And, yeah. and you developed this incredible Manhattan Symphony, which I've been to two or three of the concerts, uh -huh, uh -huh. and they're just magnificent. And They uh, are fun, yeah. You've always been very generous with your time in helping other musicians as well and, and fostering careers. And um, as I say, uh, tell us a little about how this symphony, uh, this orchestra got started. Well, um, again, it's, it was a um, sort of calling to my, my roots, uh, returning to my father's uh, music, and also being able to, for once, program the music that I love. So I didn't have to, like when you're a young violin student, your teacher tells you what to play. So you want to study this, study that, play these scales, etudes. But suddenly, when you realize you're sort of no longer a student and you're, you're studying uh, properly, uh, well, you're, you're playing what you want to play. You've already studied. You have the technique. To, you go on stage, and in a sense, like I say, I love this music. I'm proud mm, of it. Mm, mm. So suddenly, uh, somebody asked me, could I conduct something? And mm. I learned from one of the old musicians I traveled with. He said, Always say you can, and then learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. So somebody had asked him once, he was a pianist, can you play the accordion? He said, yes, I can, even mm -hmm. though he couldn't. But mm -hmm. he learned to play the accordion very quickly, and he did the job. So, so if I said, uh, play something else for us on the xylophone. 
You that I realize is quite a large uh, chunk to bite off on, but yeah. But I, I, but and you will be playing the violin for us a little. Later I'd be happy to show. play for you something. Sure, uh, we'd love that to I hear that. So, so no, seriously. So, so this. Sort but the orchestra developed, and suddenly I had yeah. at, at my disposal a fantastic instrument, which is the orchestra. Mm -hmm. Lovely people, and right. we were able to play great music. And so it was a wonderful high, and, and it's great to share my love for music with with the younger musicians. Some are older than me. But uh, I think everyone has that potential, though. When I see the audience, I feel like you spectators can also join this orchestra someday or make your own music. I, I believe people sort of limit themselves. That's true. So uh, you say I'm generous or I help young people. We should all be helping each other all the time anyway. That's what I feel. And, and transforming ourselves through the beauty of music and, right. and the world around us. That's right. And we're going to, uh, in, in a couple minutes, show a clip from our dear friend who is very unfortunately passed on, Eugene Fodor, and this mm -hmm. is a clip of him playing a, a, a violin that Paganini played. Uh, and it, it's... Yeah. Uh, That's a, a Guarnerius del Jesu, Guarnerius very likely, or Stradivarius? Uh, the Maybe Guarnerius, Guarnerius del Jesu, yeah. yes. That's in and Italy. Absolutely, but it was brought over to San Francisco. So let's play that because you've sure. also... Uh, we're you know, from the same violin. world, we're part of the, the same, same world. world absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So here's Eugene Fodor, one of the greatest violin virtuosos of our time, uh, passed on, but he's going to be playing uh, this incredibly rare uh, instrument that Paganini played, how many, two, three hundred years ago? Yeah, this, in absolutely. The, in the 18th century. So here's a, a small clip from Eugene Fodor. And before we go this morning, we want to tell you about a concert performed in California yesterday. As NBC's Bob Faw tells us, there was a special presence on stage. Last night, as Eugene Fodor played... A spirit seemed to descend on San Francisco's Herbst Theater. But this ghost was full-bodied, and all that was haunting was the lush music of Paganini, the greatest violinist the world has ever known. His music played this historic night on Paganini's own violin, an instrument so exquisite, the 18th century Italian virtuoso called its booming tones the cannon. He'd also called it the voice of the law. Meaning? Meaning that it, once it's heard, there's no argument. It's the greatest. Its sound so rich, so powerful, Fodor insists this instrument, created in 1742 by master violin maker Joseph Garnieri del Gaseu, far surpasses violins made by the fabled Stradivari. Stradivari has its merits in, in that it's a wonderful golden tone throughout. It's like a sunset from horizon to horizon. It's all gold, but Gornet del Jesu has many colors, purples, reds, oranges. Remarkable too, says Fodor, not just because the violin and Paganini were teamed up for 40 years, but also, he says, because Paganini somehow managed to transform the instrument itself. <laughs> His constant practice uh, on this instrument and performance through all those years imparted to the molecules of the wood a knowledge that stays with it for hundreds of years. Insured for $40 million, it was flown to San Francisco last week from Genoa, Italy, where it's kept under lock and key. And from the moment it touched down on American soil, it was surrounded by plainclothes San Francisco police. En route to police headquarters where the violin would be stored, Fodor could scarcely contain his excitement. Two more minutes and we see it. So, uh, ah! in, in the hotel. Later, as he rehearsed, security monitored his every move. As the artist attempted to master not just Paganini's instrument, but also the great violinist technique. I'm using uh, the fingerings the, in the way that he used them, in which I've never heard any other violinist utilize in this century. Doing all that, and with an instrument that has been played only once before in concert in this country, that might intimidate some artists, not Eugene Fodor. I feel an amazing pleasure of sharing something wonderful. I think Gene fancies himself the reincarnation of Paganini, Fodor's father said. Last night, Gene Fodor came very close. I just hope that uh, uh, if, if he's looking on somewhere, he would approve. And why wouldn't he, on this charmed evening, 
genius of the past and present were one. For today, Bob Fall, NBC News, San mm. Francisco. Well, Greg, we, we both knew Eugene very well. He passed on, uh, it's been about eight, nine years or so, and um, he was a, a master virtuoso. He went through the system, Juilliard, and he became, I was thinking, he's considered one of the greatest violinists of our time, and yet, in a sense, the system did destroy him, partly, and he was a troubled individual as well. And, and so what do you, there's a lot of emotions yeah, and sure, ideas sure, going sure, through. Sure. So what do you think of when you see Gene there playing this incredible instrument and and again, he, he, he speaks like you're speaking. He wants to share this it's love true, and yeah. beauty. And, um, and, and there's a certain passion you see in, absolutely. in Eugene's playing, a certain love yeah. for the music. And yours, too. Well, sure. Yeah. But it, it, again, it's a sanctuary for him. It's, it, 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 when you see him playing the violin, he's in a different world. Nobody can talk to him. Yeah. No one's going to yeah. ask him to pay the rent or worry about something. He's just suddenly playing the yes. violin. He's, he's in a different world. In fact, he's connecting with Paganini in the 18th century. And, and yet, being an artist or a, a composer violinist is still difficult, especially in the 21st century. Imagine these people have to travel around the world playing music, and, and it's a lot of stress. Of course, the entertainment industry takes its toll on a lot of performers. Yeah. And Eugene was quite uh, unique. He was a very passionate player, and he had some, uh, some difficulties because of it. Some issues. Uh, I mean, uh, he, he won the Paganini co competition. He was on Johnny Carson 14 yes. times. He became an extremely good-looking fellow, and he became a darling and this That's and right. that. Um, and yet, his issues took the form of, of drug use that, and alcohol yeah. I, that know, eventually did him in. In, in um, our society, it's, it's a very addictive uh, society. Our culture yes. has lots of addictions, whether it's money or fame or celebrity. Or right. ce and so recently, we've had people shooting people. Young people are, are off balance, seeking some kind of a balance or identity. So it obviously, uh, it's a very fast-paced society. And mm -hmm. if either you're with it and you can be balanced and function, or if you get pushed aside or thrown by the wayside, you're in trouble. And, that, and nowadays, of course, people are acting out and doing terrible things. So if they had music or a fine professor or a, or, or mm. a mother or a father they could look up to, something like that, they, would, they could excel for many decades doing great things. But if not, that passion, that intensity can go against them and people around them, of course. That's a great point. But also, now, you knew Gene as a kid, right? That's you correct. Went to these we went to Meadowmount School of Music together, upstate New York. OK. Uh, teenagers? As teenagers. I was before teenagers. I was probably 11, 12, 13. He was, I believe, a few years older than me. And, and so you traveled in the similar circles? Yes. You, you met the Isaac Stearns and, and so on. That's correct. So and the classical music world is pretty intense. Yes. And the standards are very, very high. Right. The expectations are very high, so there's lots of, of, of tension and pressures. And coldness. A lot of coldness, but Eugene, you know, he, he uh, has such a great gift, a great talent. He was able somehow to channel it properly into his talent and come out with some results. He, he went on stage and played beautifully, very virtuoso playing style, but still there were things bothering him that, that I think followed him his entire life. And Absolutely. And there was, I believe, some substance abuse problems here and there on there different were. things, and that's natural for many people. But uh, I think ultimately he, his health failed because he did abuse himself to some degree in that regard. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and now you've become a composer in your own right, in a sense. And uh, we'd love for, uh, for our audience to hear some of your work, whatever you'd okay. like to play at this point. We know you're also a, an absolutely terrific artist. Well, thank you. And this is a, uh, we're going to play a clip uh, toward the end of the yes. show that will we'll exhibit some, some of the artwork too. But uh, wh now, what happens here? You, these, are, these are incredible drawings. Um, yeah, we can pick up on some of that? Sure, sure. Wow, this is, this is incredible stuff here. Thank you. Well, um, the art, like, just like the, the art, like my, my music, uh, just as an expression of the moment, uh, many times a spontaneous way. Now with the art, I don't need a full symphony orchestra. I can just get a, a blank piece of paper with a pencil or some colors and start to create something which is finished. I don't, I don't have to rely on something else. And then uh, a friend of mine so kind, uh, kindly put together the artwork as a collection in, in a calendar format or a little mm -hmm. book format. Of course, I wouldn't mind finding a publisher out there somewhere. But the mm -hmm. artwork is uh, a spontaneous expression. And the music the same way. Um, I woke up one day with this Central Park waltz in my head and I began writing it out. 
and every once in a while I, I, I have another melody and I start to, to work on it, and it's all melody based. It's a melody based. It's not modern abstract music. It's not very intellectual. Um, huh. But uh, I never really had a great technique of, of musical knowledge and theory, but with simple melodies I can construct something. And then I add an extra melody, I, I add a little something in the beginning, and before I know it I have a composition. And I'm pretty modest about my uh, sort of image as a composer per se, but oh. I do write music. Interesting. And you wanted to play something sure, today that would be a premiere? Well, since you, uh, si oh, the premiere I'll play you in one second, but just to let okay. the audience see, in a sense, acoustically a little bit live, yeah. Um, since you played the Central Park Walls uh, on the corner of uh, 80th and Broadway, 83rd and Broadway, where, where my little string quartet played some music when I had an art exhibition at the kiosk that a fellow named Linus is a curator for on 83rd and Broadway uh, on the southwest corner, uh, I brought a quartet to play. So um, we did the Central Park Waltz, which I saw you were playing for the public, so it goes like this. Um, should I, I, I still remain here, yeah. yeah. a second melody. So, Beautiful. so I build really. two little melodies together and right. put it together, and suddenly I'm a composer. You are. But the other right. piece, which is a premiere um, on this show, I've never played for anybody in public because I'm just working it out now and arranging it a bit. And that is um, a piece which, for now, I, I have no title for, and I have lyrics even, but I'm not mentioning the lyrics. But it goes like this. Like, I think, how does it begin? Let's see. <laughs> um, uh, Oh gosh, I forgot how it goes. Let me think. Uh, how to play you notes. Oh yeah. Hmm. Let's see. Thank you. Um, it's a little bit of a patriotic song, so I leave the lyrics yeah. out of it for now because I don't want to uh, maybe s go down the line too much so uh, the subject of politics per se, but well, it is an old-fashioned patriotic song. Uh, I'm going to have it arranged uh, for a larger orchestra kind of sound. And uh, so When it's you say patriotic, okay, so what vision well, of example, America? You're talking about We America? have a concert July 1st. At okay. Merkin Hall. Merkin Hall. Hall. 67th? Uh, 67th off of, off of Broadway, and I think it's spelled M E R K I N, Merkin Hall. Right. And we're doing a concert in the evening there. Um, and obviously, being a July 4th week, uh, we're going right. to be doing some patriotic songs. And um, it would be uh, the occasion to do some Copeland, perhaps, or Gershwin, things like that. And uh, when I say patriotic, I mean, I guess, putting aside all of the conflicts that are in the air these days about. Uh, uh, race and guns and, and the, the presidency, uh, that kind of thing. I figure that, again, in bolstering the feeling that we're all Americans and we have a certain freedom to discuss these differences and argue and, and mm. disagree, that if we could also not forget that fact, that still the system of, even in this case, Republicans and Democrats and conservatives and liberals and all of this has a long tradition. And if we can work within that tradition, unless you wanted to change the government into a socialist or a, cap or a communist or uh, mm. anarchist type e existence, if we believe in the, the system we've achieved for only a mere few hundred years, 
then we have to work within that construct. So, cons so to answer your question perhaps more succinctly is that patriotic means at least giving an overall general uh, salute to America. A, a love for the concept of what America can be that transcends our political and cultural divisions in a sense, or our, our vehicle through which we can learn to love each other and transcend some of the political and economic difficulties we're having. That's why I like you so much. I know, but Jim, uh, because but you're so you're a great New Yorker. And, and, and you so are and you. I'm so glad I met Although you. Although you were born in Corpus Christi. That's true. I'm a Texan. The blood at least originally, but again And I was just at Gary Knowles retreat in, in you East see, Texas. When I start to flatter you, you get and that, no, you I can't know, just I say know, thank no, you. No, no, so I, I do. Thank you. No, 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 I'm just you don't have to say thank you. But I'm And your father was you're very you're just Dallas in this kind of No, but you're very eloquent and what you said is true. Talking about transcending, etc., and being giving, paying a little bit of respect or tribute at least to the forefathers who established a country which is supposed to be based on freedom, and there were problems. Yeah, and we're rectifying problem. those problems, yeah. one by one, hopefully. Right. But go back. Okay. okay so I'll what was, what was Copeland want. doing? What was Copeland trying to do? A Appalachian Copeland Spring. Copeland was a Jewish and man named Kaplan. And he so changed his name was Gershwin because okay, of so racism and prejudice. Right. He changed his name to Copeland, and he wrote okay. very American music. He loved America. He did. So he did. Uh, Irving Berlin. Did Irving too. Berlin, similar. White and Christmas, George M. So Cohan. I mean, there were George many uh, people who. I mean, f there are people listen from all over the world who come to America to contribute, to write music, to make movies and to, to seek their freedom uh, of this country. And others come, and they're not too happy, or they want to, yeah. Well, I got that, but, but uh, you mentioned Copeland and, and Gershwin, and you're going to have Oh, I see, July 1st, yeah. And July 1st, and so you just played this Well, if you want to hear the... So what were you... Uh, envisioning? Uh, envisioning, what do you imagine Copeland and Gershwin are envisioning as they try to express their love through their music about... America. I think people feel it. Again, music being a very universal language, and that's why I do enjoy traveling, playing some music, uh, different kinds of music to people. Uh -huh. um, when people hear Copeland, they, we were going to do, for instance, the Lincoln portrait. Yeah. And I wanted a very famous actor to do the narration. But it turns out we disagree politically. And he decided okay. not, to not to participate. Really? Because he felt because I was too patriotic. In one sense. Now, I, I shouldn't <coughs> say that word. He, that was not the word he used. But in, <laughs> a, s but in a sense... Well, what did he use? What did he say? Uh, he said, I can't trust you. What does that mean? He Wait, now, thought, let he, me understand. Yeah. There's a musician that you he's wanted... A, no, he's an, oh, actor, an actor. You actor. wanted him to perform in this presentation. Yeah, the Copeland the piece Copeland. has a narrator. So what does that It have to talks do? about the Gettysburg right. Address. It talks about how great Abraham Lincoln was. Right. And how it says at one point, he quotes uh, Li uh, Lincoln... As I would not be a slave, I would not own slaves. I would not be an owner okay. of slaves. And wonderful statements, very dramatic. Right. But this particular uh, famous actor felt that I was going to be using the, 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 the podium July uh -huh. 4th weekend to be too patriotic. I might may, may say something uh, uh, sort of supportive of the presidency, of our current president. Okay. And he, he was, didn't feel that I way. I see. So he felt like, I'm not sure, Greg, you're, you're a little bit... You know. He wasn't sure. So politics does enter into Yes, very good point and very interesting, yes. As we've <laughs> noticed in Hollywood, we've yeah. a lot of, the, 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 uh, a lot of uh, actors and actresses are against the president, and yet they, tend to make, they continue to make movies of violence and terrible uh, okay, so promotion of, of terrible uh, conflicting uh, feelings there. They make movies with guns and everything, and yet they want to take guns away from the American citizens because they blame guns as the crime, but the, the, b behind the gun is the, is the insane person. But instead well, of dealing with I mental illness in case. this country, we need to deal with mental illness in this country. But most mentally ill people are, are not violent. So but they go to the movies and they see violence. But well, the actors who are in those movies protest violence in America and take the guns away. And we don't like Donald Trump because he's protecting, uh, is it the First Amendment or Second Amendment? Yeah, Second Amendment. Yeah, second but Amendment. All right. So oh, that's you know that's a common argument so amongst people who are on different okay, sides so of the aisle. Okay, so there's sort of hypocrite, uh, hypocrisy among. He was sort of afraid that I was going to be too liberals. patriotic. He himself claimed to be more of a socialist, more of but a communist. Why can't you? Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to do the Lincoln portrait. I told him I, I like him. I respect him. No, because I respected him so much. And I felt if he's not going to do it, I'm going to I'll do something else. And I'm also going to be doing some music that I wrote, which I think the audience would enjoy. Right, but but going back, so you're not doing that piece Don't make at all. You're not having another actor. Do no, that? I'm not. But it's such a beautiful. Else. In terms of patriotism, now, is there another word you could... If you President Trump contacted me and said, I will do the Lincoln portrait, you can be sure I will do the Lincoln portrait with Donald Trump, but not anybody else. 
Okay. Well, you, you got into pull so your strings, yeah, yeah. Jim. Talk to your people. Yeah, see if you contact that, that. from this show on the Merkin. Uh, you're not, you're, you, well, you he know. might tweet this. Uh, it happened so only he on this would, show. So he would play. He would play. If you Lincoln invite him, this? if you invite the yeah. president via your show to perform <laughs> with Manhattan Symphony, the Lincoln Portrait, and he would, I will conduct him. Conduct him in, in New York in and in Washington D.C. In D.C. Okay, and in Dallas. Uh, anywhere, anywhere he, he wants. He wants to and he would be asked to do some of the narration, or if he there wanted. There is a narration to, that he would play. It, it Lincoln. says it starts out Abraham Lincoln, sixteenth president of right. these United States. This is what he said. This is what Abraham Lincoln said. Right. That's how it begins. And Donald Trump could read those words with this beautiful music surrounding and him, and it would be wonderful. So you, you know, Jim, that's not a bad idea for him to, to do. You should, uh, you're right. Now. Because <laughs> then the people who don't like him will see that he's human and that he's talented and more than that. But I won't go any further because I don't want to infuriate no, your, your audience. No, no, no. They're not infuriated. They're enthralled. They're ready to. Even though they're loading their guns and sharpening nah, their knives. Well, there's no guns in the world. They're waiting way. for me outside the building. They're, no, no. You're going to be safe. But no, there is a certain, there is, I, I, I get your point. And look, when we're talking about a transformative world of love, and nurturing. We're, we, uh, as, as you know, mm -hmm. one of the. Um, oh, I don't want to. This is a rare violin you brought from Gregory Singer's sure, rare from, violin. Yes, from Italy. Shop, which we also. Have. But, you know, look. There's no. Uh, I don't hide this button. We shall overcome. This is Reverend William Barber's Poor People's Campaign. We've talked about this. We've uh, a lot on the show. We've had members of, of Cairo Center, uh, all kinds of activists and and, and, and uh, rabbis and ministers who are part of the movement. So uh, we talk about that. We, we're going to have Reverend Barber on it at some point, hopefully over the summer. We are, right, uh, yeah. we are I'm involved. I'm involved, going to be involved in direct action. Mother's You're very Day. dedicated. Well, I am dedicated because I, I'm really, and there's going to be actually a, I'm going to get a plug in here on this. There's going to be a, uh, a benefit May 3rd, Thursday, uh, supporting the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, this is going to be at po Poco, 7 to 9, 30, uh, 33 Avenue B at 3rd Street. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the things, I'm, I'm bringing this up because Barber and others that we've had on the show speak to the point where we've got to stop the hate and violence. And even among those who... <laughs> Disagree. We disagree. Absolutely. We've got to learn to transcend that and reach people. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would argue uh, very strongly, too, that um, Donald Trump, as well as many other politicians and many other people in your field as well, um, in, in the music field, have been severely hurt and abused it's true. themselves. And they, they've turned on other people and used it. So in other words, what we're trying to say here, I think we're on the same we page, are, in many ways. that we need to, as, as Reverend Barber also points out, we need to find ways to love each other and transcend our differences. And that's but you part have of to the reason But you I have to want yeah, to do it ahead. first. No, but you have to want to do it first. Right. What happens is people okay. are, are set in a certain way. You have to break they're through set. that barrier. And their reaction right. is a knee-jerk reaction, right. and they're not going to listen to each other. In fact, it's very interesting. My own daughters in my own household, <laughs> they will not allow me to watch Fox News on Channel 44 here in New York because I enjoy watching the show very much and I yeah. find they're very intelligent people, very happy people, and creative people. But when Sean I have Hannity is a happy person. H Hannity so? is very, mo a very intellectually articulate man he, who yeah. has a real mission. He thinks he that he's seen corruption. There's a swamp being drained. It's not, a, it's not an easy job. And he really believes this man, who was a Democrat himself, Mr. Trump, was not supported by Republicans or Democrats, which okay. is a very good sign. We wanted somebody from the outside. The outside man came in, and we began to label him. Oh, he's this, he's that. He's not making friends. But, but guess what today happened with yeah, the leader yeah. of France in New York? And, and the North Korean negotiations with the South Koreans and, the Ameri and with Mr. Trump going, perhaps. President Trump. But you're raising, you see, yeah, there's, there's a lot of progress point, going that on. There are here. a lot of people who are on different sides of who course. feel very passionate. Very much and, so. And, uh, and, and, and are in the best of, of, of America's interests. They yes. feel they're yes. acting in the best of America's interests. And, and of course, that's part of the story. Let me, let me just bring it a little more concretely. Daniel Berenbaum? Great conductor, great Is music, he great still 
uh, bringing together Palestinians and Israelis? I believe so. In and it, and what do you what do you think well, about what, that what, sort what, of what musical Daniel, effort? What Daniel Barenboim did, and he was a very very f a famous conductor. Um, he well, he's still alive, right? Still alive, um, but he's a great pianist, great conductor. And caused great dissent in uh, Israel well, he, and he, in He wanted Arab to have world, right? a community in the Middle East right. with Arabs and Jews living, coexisting together. Right. And he, he built a community, a, 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 a town out in the desert uh, is the image. The Negev? And, the, yeah, and, and they, they, and they yeah. were doing very, very well. And maybe they still are doing very, very well. But the idea, whether it still lasts forever or didn't last, uh, was this idealistic dream that, of course, people... Now, when my father and you're doing that too, my father aren't did you? the same thing, and you too. Yeah. So what what did your father do? This my father back did in Europe one of the first classical music concerts in Nazareth, where Jews and Arabs sat together under the same tent. What and year was this? I think when it has to be early. Well, before his thirties, maybe in the thirties, yeah, late thirties, early forties, perhaps. Before the state. Yeah, I have a program that has different photographs of the of the event, and it was quite amazing and and, and well known. They asked him to stay in, in Haifa and become the, the conductor. The mayor of Haifa asked him to stay in Israel and conduct it. So My you father, would have been... He, he was going to America. You would have been a Sabra. Yeah. You would have been... My I would Venice. have been Gregory still. Uh, Gregory, yeah, the yeah. Sabra, you would have been a kibbutz. I, I, I like to unify myself <laughs> with all people. I don't really label myself as I'm this or I'm that or this religion, that right. religion, or this race, that race. Uh, I'm a little bit of a mixed background, and I think we're, we're all trying to be a similar. Being human is what we're, we have a place for. But, um, no, I, I believe playing music uh, is a very universal language. People love music, and really people love each other. The politicians have an axe to grind, and they like to make dissent and make people join forces against each other. But uh, people like Daniel Barenboim, uh, they make peace, they make music, they want people to be together. But there are other sort of like gang leaders that want to make their <laughs> gang fight the other gang. And this <laughs> should be eventually outdated kind of mode. People are getting smarter with the internet communication. Yeah. They don't really want to be uh, uh, pitted against each other. And uh, I think we have to realize mm -hmm. we have certain tendencies to judge before we listen. In fact, that's why I believe even that actor who, who decided not to do the Lincoln portrait with me should have given us a chance to show the beauty and, and to give the message. In fact, I, I think like so the too, idea by that the we way. didn't agree. I like the idea that we didn't agree yeah. that we could perform together on the same stage. It would have been wonderful. I do. T I agree. But maybe Donald Trump will do it. So can I well, ask him on your show? I, and you can ask him whoever you want to ask. But you want to play a, another? But sure. Be happy another to piece something. on peace. Okay, peace on peace. On peace on peace. Okay. On harmony I'll and play love. A little bit of some different Whatever you want to play. Okay. I, 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 since I was born in Texas, I'll play you a little. A little hoedown style. Hoedown style. <laughs> And I've been to concerts where you have reached jaded Upper West Side New Yorkers mm -hmm. with that music. Really? You and so I that? have, and I'm they've even here. smiled, and they've yeah, gotten yeah. into it, yeah, yeah. and there you go. Music's fun. That's an example. It is sure, fun. Sure. It is fun. Yeah. Um, but I'm very impressed with you, Jim. I'm going to tell you, I feel you have <laughs> a very big heart, and you're very disciplined. Um, you have a certain uh, conviction and ideology. And you're, you're striving to speak with people, to reach out in a we very do. kind voice. We try to do And that. very understanding. And it, it's not hypocritical and very nice because you're Thank willing you. to invite me on, even though perhaps politically we're on different sides of the aisle, so to speak. But you really are a wonderful New Yorker. And, is, and I'm so glad you have this show. And you're having great success. And Thank it's, you. It's a, you know, there are many people who do different things for other, that are not val valid, this and that. You earn a, a very good position here in respect of many, many people because you have a good heart and you're trying every day to bring people together. 
and it's very Thank nice. Thank you. I really appreciate it, and that, that is what we're trying to do with this show. It's not easy always, the is it? radical message. Well, it, it, it's easy with people like you coming oh, thank on. You. Really I really, really mean that. And, and, uh, but it's not easy. In other words, like I say, like Eugene Fodor and like other artists who are doing their art, uh, the musicians, um, there, you know, there are foundations and grants, and I'm not sure what Mr. Trump has done for the arts, perhaps not too much. He seems to be rather conservative in that regard. But we all, as Americans, in a way, have to fend for ourselves. In some socialist countries, they take care of people in different ways, this and that. But in America, really, you have to pull your own uh, way. You, and so I have to, I'm out there alone trying to be an artistic person, and it's not easy. You are. You're, yeah. Well, you're a musical yeah. entrepreneur in a I sense. I can't help it, though. It's the survival also, but it's also part of my nature. But I'm just saying uh, it's not easy to continue that, that sort of good fight. And uh, it'd be good to hook up more and more people who like to share and who are not hypocritical. And I, I believe you're doing that. And, and so this is a call out, again, thank you very much. And, and this is a, and, and I appreciate your efforts because I think you're doing very similar sorts of things in, in music. It's true. I can't resist helping people. People come yeah. to my door at my violin shop or to my orchestra. They want to audition. They need to borrow an instrument. They need to borrow this. They need to see. And I'm Absolutely. always interested in helping people. I've I, seen that. I'm really, like this yeah, is you've no, seen it. Yeah, no yeah. BS here. No, he does you know, this guy. But you know, they go to Zay Bars, yeah. right, which is right yeah. on the corner. They have some <laughs> lox and bagels. They go out yeah. and then yes, buy a, yeah. a $25,000 um, But I don't flatter instrument. myself, Jim. I don't flatter myself, though. I'm yeah. doing great do From uh, you. good deeds. No, I believe people, first of all, should try to help each other. And when I was growing up as a, as a young uh, music student, uh, I, I was struggling quite a bit alone, and I didn't get a lot of yes. I got a lot of no's. And now that I'm a little bit older, certainly more mature, a little bit more mature, quite a bit older, and a little, little wiser, I, I like to say yes to people. When they have projects or they need a little help, I like to say yes, let's see how that can be done. And many times, I help other people before I help myself, mm -hmm. but that's an, a human nature. But I don't flatter myself it's a, a great altruistic thing. I think a little bit maybe it's a mental illness or something why <laughs> I want to save the world or help others. But that is part of my makeup, and I have to be careful with that. Well, you're <laughs> careful enough. I think you've got a, a, a great balance on it. But, but it's interesting. There was a <coughs> so on, on the one hand, you, you don't feel the government should be helping as much right. with the arts, That's national correct. public radio. I mean, I don't like handouts. You know, I, I oh, don't think is that how you see it, yes, or or to some are we left then with the Carl Acons or the the well, uh, what, the, the Koch brothers? The problem, yeah. the problem uh, is like this. The conflict wh is like what are this. we left with? First then? of all, I feel first and who of all, goes to these concerts now? How much does it cost? Well, the to audience go has changed a lot. First of yes. all, with a lot of popular music, how much are the tickets? Tickets are very expensive. So expensive, I cannot go. I can't, unless right. a person invites me, I don't even go to see how much they cost. Tickets, unless you go in intermission and Tickets get are usually 50 60 $70, you know. At least. Yeah, at least. So basically, uh, the, the, the problem, the conflict here is that I felt if my music is good enough or my art, there'll be a following. If not, I'm not going to throw money at it per se. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I do need money to pay my musicians, to rent mm -hmm. the concert halls, Absolutely. to print calendars and books if I can develop more uh, of a... Of a uh, connection to the publishing, etc. But I do believe there has to be a, a, a market for me. Mm -hmm. if, I, if, I'm, if I'm dressed yeah. in my father's tales right. and nobody cares about the violin, they want to hear guitars and, and t right. okay, that's the way it goes. Uh, I'm right. not going to push myself. You know, there's an expression, more than the farmer needs, needs to give the milk, uh, uh, more than the cow needs to give the milk. No, what is the expression? The farmer more wants. Than the, no, more than the yeah. farmer needs the milk, the cow needs to give it. Well, I'm the musician of that. More than people need to hear me play, I need to perform. But I figured if I play well enough, uh, it's like Bush, fool me once. And remember that he yeah, said that yeah, he yeah, 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 right. yeah, But, yeah, but yeah. if the audience really likes what I do, and they like my orchestra, and they like my artwork, I will be discovered someday, hopefully before I die. You trust. But if not, I don't think the government should give me a huge grant. But a little right. grant would be nice. Okay. But since they don't exist, then in the private sector, someone who's a supposed cultural arts sponsor or patron should look me up. Gregory okay. Singer, Gregory and Singer. I'm there, and I'm certainly interested in, in expanding my audience and my, you know. And you've taken the, your orchestra to China. China. You've been to China, what, five trips? Here? I conducted in, in Russia and in, in Italy Russian and in Italy. China, five tours. Interesting. Um, China is a fantastic place, a wonderful place, uh, very strong, hardworking people. Uh, they, they have an air pollution problem around the big cities in particular. Right. But I find the place sort of like the, the old Wild West of America. It's not that wild, but the people, there's not a lot of uh, 
protections and unions and people have to be pretty sharp to survive. Huh. I saw window wash washers on little ropes coming down from the 40th floor. W really? You know, yeah, and you, can, you know if one falls, he's done. The family's out yeah. of business and yeah. there's not going to be any, any due process to compensate him. Hmm. I mean, they work hard and they have to be very sharp people. <laughs> and not fall off those, uh, not fall those, off those ropes. Strings or but ropes what sort of music did you play in China? All, ca all kinds well, of I'll music? Well, I'll play you a piece real quick, if I may. It's yeah, a, we're a piece I wrote. Got a few more minutes. We'd love to hear like you play uh, again. It sounds like a Chinese piece. I wrote that. You did? Yeah, I wrote that. So wow. influenced by the Chinese music, huh. uh, I wrote that for my orchestra, and they enjoy it very much. Yeah. And we wrote some. We did some American music. We did cheek you to did. cheek, and uh, you know Who this kind of thing. Was it Cole Porter? Or So we had tap dancer. Tap dancer. A fellow okay. named Luke was a wonderful tap dancer. We had singers, and we did sometimes summertime, sometimes Gershwin Rhapsody in Blue, sometimes some Chinese music, and, and they really enjoyed the show. And I did, I did too. I, I, for me, I'm one of the luckiest men in the world to take his own orchestra to China and play some Chinese music. Absolutely. And it's, it was a wonderful uh, thing for me. If and your guy pulls off a miracle, what a meeting uh, in North Korea, you might Do be Donald? going to... Yeah, I would go to and North Donald, Korea and play you, for You might period. go to North Korea, right? Yeah. What I would you play for, uh, for North Koreans? North Koreans? Um, hmm. What do you think? They, something patriotic? Um, <laughs> well, you know, when I was break, in China, break the I opened ice. the show. It's a good question. When I was in China, yeah. I opened the show with a Chinese national anthem. And many times I opened shows with the American national anthem. And I, I would learn, well, uh, hmm. at the moment, there's probably a North Korean national anthem and there's a South Korean national anthem. Uh, so I'm not sure what I would open the show with. And playing devil's advocate, sure. the critics would say, how can you do this with such a despotic regime who has treated his people? In North Korea? North Korea, for oh, example. No, they're terrible, terrible. No, the but, regime is but, terrible. But no, 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 I wouldn't do it unless, unless President Trump, uh, of course, gave okay. He said, you can go, and we're doing this in the spirit of reunification of Korea. And by the way, I love okay. the Korean people. Korean right. food is wonderful. Their, in their history, their culture is incredible. Absolutely. They're way, way advanced people. And, and uh, if, you know, if he said, okay, this is part of the celebration of uh, reunification, I would bring my orchestra. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And transcend, oh, transcend our differences with the love and the music. Tear down the wall. Yeah. The, the zone, the military zone. That would zone be that. What the height of my life to be able to do part of that celebration. You know, I, I very much hope you get a chance to do that. Well, it's call up Donald. Show. Call him up Wait, yourself well, I, your show connection. And say, we look, will. we have a challenge for you. You're doing the Lincoln portrait. There you go. As well as, as, well we'll as the and, and White House and North Korea. All right. Well, we reach a lot of people on this show. That's so wonderful. Yeah. We, we, listen, we have a, a minute to go. Okay. Can we go yes. out with something that you'd love to, to yes. express to us yes. here? I'm going to play something a, a little bit American. It goes like this. Beautiful. Thank Maestro, you, thank you so much. This terrific. is to peace and harmony. Peace and harmony. And everything Love you and want music. to do, I trust you. You're Absolutely. wonderful. I trust you too. Thank you, Jim. I trust wonderful. you too. A real pleasure. Terrific. Gregory Singer here on the Radical Imagination. Thank you so very, very much. This is Jim Brettos. We're going to see you again next week on the Radical Imagination. We have a short clip of Gregory and his artwork and music, and then we're going to close it out with Reverend William Barber, how we need a moral transformation and a musical transformation of our culture. Thank you once again. Uh, we'll see you next week on the Radical Imagination. This is Jim Fredos.
Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I thought after our 4th of July weekend festivities, Independence Day, I would share a little nice music with you. Hope you enjoy it. I want to talk about why we must have, I believe, a moral movement across this country. We're in a time where corporations are treated like people and people are treated like things. They promote legislation that attacks voting rights, the poor, LGBT citizens, the immigrant community, and civil rights that are lewd, mean, spirited, and fundamentally contrary to what our democracy is supposed to be about. What is bad is not what they are doing. What would be bad is for us not to fight back. That's what would be bad. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, Martin King is not going to get back up. Tell him, say, the old labor leaders that died are not going to get back up. But guess what? When anybody challenges our deepest moral principles and our deepest democratic principles. You and I were born for such a time as this, and we must fight back now. <laughs>